thank you very much and thank you to Cease for supporting this initiative. And also thank you to Tom, anti-sexist man, he carries a card, I love feminists, who's going to do the technology because we're just girls. And, uh, <laughs> so thank you, Tom. OK, so a little bit of history about how we decided, why we decided to do this training. So I'll go through um, a few of the slides and then Fiona um, will take over, but cut in at the same time. So I'm a journalist, um, but I was a feminist campaigner for a long time before I became a journalist. Met Fiona back in 1996, and Fiona hadn't been that long out of the sex trade. And we spoke about the way that the media portrays um, prostitution as is an issue and women in prostitution and the men who buy women in prostitution and how that then has um, a really significant impact on the way that the general public see this issue. And in fact, the reason why I wrote the book that I did that came out a couple of years ago on you know, breaking down a lot of the myths and um, lies told by the pro-prostitution lobby was because everywhere I went in the world, pretty much, as a feminist campaigner, whether I was speaking to regular people that I met in restaurants that might have been conservatives or left-wing activists during my work or interviewees that should know better, when I asked them what should we do to solve the problems inherent to the sex trade, they would pretty much come up with the same thing, which was legalise it, make it safer for the girls, because they're never women. They're always girls in the sex trade. And I started thinking, well, this just is so persuasive, at least with, <clears throat> with other forms of violence against women that I've been campaigning against. At least you actually get to say to people, and some will listen, you know, a short skirt and an alcoholic drink does not tell men that we are consenting to sex. Women do not enjoy domestic violence. Sometimes they stay because it's too frightening to leave. And those myths get slowly broken down. But with the sex trade, obviously, we have particular ways of speaking about it and language that I know has come up earlier this morning that tells a totally Orwellian story about what the reality is. So, um, for example, um, the term sex worker replaced prostitute, which also is a word that I don't use, some time ago. In fact, it now is used de rigueur by the media, police, other criminal justice agencies, health agencies, the lot. And it's now almost every single piece that you will read, whether it's the liberal press or the tabloid press, you will, you'll get this. Even to the point when, I mean, when we're talking about violence against the women in prostitution and also children, you have words like profession, sex work, profession. So do you see what they're doing here? And people think it dignifies the women, and Fiona will speak to this more. But it's sometimes for good reason, but it completely obscures the reality. And also, there are... I mean, look at this. What's wrong with this headline? The Guardian, a few years ago, published a brilliant piece, an investigative piece, about prostituted, sexually exploited, mass-raped children found in a brothel in Thailand. And they used the term trafficked sex workers. Trafficked sex workers. I mean, this just is, do you see how mad it is? Because what they're trying to do is apply language to something where the language just does not fit at all. <clears throat> and, and then again, you know, the furniture around articles, which is the, the pull quotes, the stand first, which is the explanation under the headline, the photographs, can completely um, distort the meaning of any article. I can't tell you the number of times I've sent my article in about violence against women in prostitution, about all kinds of horrors in the sex trade, and someone will put sex worker in the heading. 
and they'll also put a picture, even when I've written about the men who pay for access to the inside of women's bodies, they'll put a picture of a woman, right? So see this? This is a piece about men being arrested. How rare is it that we actually have a focus on the punters? Do we have a photograph of a punter? No, of course we don't. We have the requisite woman bending over, looking into a car window. And if you think about the way that the <coughs> media will, again, over and over, look at the men as though they are unproblematic, whilst even when they're reporting about men being arrested, and yet the women are scum. So on the one hand, you've got sex worker, and you've got manager instead of pimp and you've got brothel owner instead of pimp. <clears throat> and then you have Richard Littlejohn, who, when the bodies of the five murdered women in Ipswich were discovered, murdered by a punter, of course, a trusted punter, so much for the instinct that helps sex workers avoid danger and death, he decided that these are the people's prostitute because no one really gives a damn about these hookers. And in fact, he goes on to say even worse, that we should be looking for cures for cancer rather than giving a damn about murder inquiries when it's just this scum on the streets. Now, <coughs> during the time that the murders were happening in Ipswich, I went to Ipswich and did some reports for The Guardian and went to the trial. And during this time, there were news reporters, there were feature writers like me, there were opinion writers. And we had an email round from the reader's editor at The Guardian, which is the person that sets the kind of editorial standards. So whether you use capital letters for certain things, whether you say climate crisis or climate change, that kind of thing, and said, We've got some problems here with inconsistency. Some of you are referring to the women as prostitutes. Some of you are saying sex workers, what should we say? And I, of course, wrote back and said, just call them women. Because there is no need to refer to a woman as a prostitute. Is something done to her? Everybody else said sex workers. That's what the women tell us. Well, the women don't tell them that. The pro-prostitution lobbyists tell them that. So this, I mean, this would be funny if it wasn't actually tragic, this. How sex workers encounter pleasure with clients. The article should just say never. <laughs> right? Really short article, no need for sub, <laughs> subheadings a lot. I mean, what? And this is where we go into the woke coverage of prostitution, where we had Teen Vogue recently. Um, Teen Vogue tell young women that sex work was a dignified profession. This is Propaganda 101. So, if you think about the term trafficking and force, right? so just to see those two things together is actually against the Palermo Protocol, which was, I think, ratified by the UK, some legal person in the audience will tell me whether I'm wrong, um, signed by the UK in a number of countries, which looked at the definition of trafficking and any country's responsibility in dealing with the demand and the exploitation, etc. And after a massive battle between abolitionist feminists and human rights campaigners and pro-prostitution activists like those from Holland whose salaries relied on, you know, the, the continued propaganda of how brilliant legalisation is. <clears throat> the abolitionists won on a really important point, which is that you do not have to prove force to say that you are a victim of trafficking. But the very act, because trafficking is just a process as we know, the prostitution is the actual experience, that it's about not even being moved from one town or one city to another, but the, the actual exploitation. So force has never been a requirement. But again and again, we see this, which leads us to believe, those of us that aren't in the know about this, 
that it's only forced prostitution or those that are trafficked by force that are worthy of our support and are themselves experiencing the horrors of prostitution. Is that it? So just to finish before I hand you over to Fiona, um, as a journalist and as a feminist campaigner, I can't tell you how crucial it is that we have these arguments with editors, um, with radio producers, with those that might ask you to come onto, your, onto their programme before you do it. Set the parameters, correct things that they put in your article or that they write about you or your organisation. And when they tell you that they've spoken to sex workers, the English Collective of Prostitutes, whoever, whoever, give them some information about which organisations actually are led by survivors, by sex trade survivors, and not the ideological pro-prostitution academics that have no idea whatsoever what this is about. Because unless the general public looks at responsible reporting on this, then we will really struggle to convince people what the reality is. Thanks, Julie. Hello, everyone. I'm really sorry, first of all, that I couldn't make it this morning. Um, I heard it was a brilliant morning. And uh, yeah, so um, I, I want to tell you about some personal experiences I've had with the media. And um, when I first exited the world of um, prostitution and I started to speak out, in actual fact, it wasn't about my own experiences. Um, the, the reason I exited was because I got a very uh, sharp wake-up call when my 17-year-old cousin was murdered by a sex buyer. She'd been introduced to heroin at 14 years of age and um, was selling sex, uh, well, being abused, being raped, paid rape, um, to sustain her heroin ad addiction and that of her perpetrator, um, Pimp. And, um, and one of the main reasons as well for me starting to speak out was the media and the way how appalling they were around Maureen's murder. They, <clears throat> excuse me, they never referred to her as Maureen. They never used her name. They never used a nice class photograph of her or birthday photo of her, which they do with mm. young women who might be murdered um, who are not in the sex trade. It was a photo of her gouching from heroin and it was the mugshot from when she were being arrested. Well, she had a loving family um, and she was a beautiful, beautiful young woman. Um, so that's really what really started my, um, my reasons for, for wanting to speak to the media. They also camped out outside Maureen's parents' house. There were two teenage children it was just horrendous. They couldn't even go and view a body or go to deal with any funeral um, or anything because they couldn't get out of their door because of the hounding of the press. Interestingly, the man who murdered her, um, George Naylor, obviously for the, for the legal reasons, he was fully protected. Um, she was referred to as teenage hooker, um, band of gold look-alike, all kind of salacious, ridiculous um, headlines, absolute and, and untruths, full of untruths. Um, in fact, you know, th things about a family and, and such like, whereas George Naylor obviously was protected. It wasn't until he was found guilty of murder that his previous convictions, as we know, 
were, were, were um, public. And he'd in fact left for dead a neighbour of his who was a spinster in her 70s. He'd raped her and left her for dead in the 70s. But Rough Justice got involved in his case and, and he was freed. He then killed a 19-year-old young woman whose body was found in the footwell of his car <coughs> in Bradford and he got off on the grounds of provocation. He was given a very short sentence and after his release, within no time at all, he murdered Maureen. So, you know, and a lot of the pro-lobby often um, scream and shout in my face that I've got blood on my hands um, because I talk against the sex trade and I don't want um, I don't want it legalised, um, then I'm apparently responsible for the death of vulnerable women. Well, I, I, I promised you I won't swear today. I'm not going to, but, I, you know, leave it we to your imagination <laughs> as to what I said to that. <laughs> um, so then I became a volunteer at a very, uh, uh, a work, uh, working women's project who um, actually the manager of is now one of the leading sex pro-sex work lobbyists in Europe and is paid to be a pro leading sex work lobbyist and is a pimp basically she, she, there's nothing else I can say about her she tried to silence me so much that she in <coughs> fact collected all the newspaper articles that I'd done and the TV Times, even highlighted in the TV Times when I'd been on, I should have to admit, Kilroy. Um, We've all done it. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and I was a single parent um, on benefits, getting paid absolutely nothing for the work that I did. It's very recently, actually, I've been paid for any of my work. She, um, she sent it in a brown envelope to the benefits office um, and I was cautioned uh, about fraud. Um, so again, the silencing, you know, I, I was in the media for, for good reason, and the silencing was, but I, I just want to tell you that because I just think it's important how the different tactics are used to silence women mm. um, by, by the pro lobby. And also, one, another thing I want to say is I had no boundaries when I came out of that life. I was 15 when I was introduced to um, being raped 10 times a day by 10 different men. You know, that was the, that was the minimum, uh, by the way. Um, and I had no boundaries. I had no idea who I was. I had no identity. I, you know, I, um, I just didn't know how to say no to anything um, so I went on everything everybody asked me to I was all over the place <coughs> I would be interviewed by anybody who'd want to speak to me and they there was a power dynamic they it was their agenda fortunately over time I've managed to find my boundaries and I now own my story and as much as I can I speak live uh, I go on live radio and TV because I don't want them editing out and cutting my words I speak to the editor before I go on and make it very clear to them that if they use the term sex work I'll be walking off set that still doesn't seem to really, they don't, still don't seem to hear it. Um, in fact, um, I was on Radio Woman's Hour just a few months ago. There was a pro-prostitution pro woman speaking about how decrim is so important. I then, and, and made reference to, the, uh, to a report in 2016, which we all know about that report and who led that report and who resigned from a very powerful position because of his behaviour. I named that person on radio and my mic was closed off and the pro-prostitution person was given <coughs> the rest 
the, the time, you know, the rest of the interview. Um, there's so many examples of that, it's, it's unbelievable. And, and uh, I don't know if all of you know about the court case that's going on at the moment. So there's myself and other women who are holding the state to account to have our so-called criminal records cleared. Um, I have an eight-page double-sided document that describes my abuse, but is framed as a criminal record. Describes me as a common prostitute, loitering for the purposes of being a common prostitute. Um, and the conviction started in 1985 and ended in 1988, but I managed to get a double-sided criminal record in that time. So fortunately we got a hook and we've got to the Royal Courts of Justice and of course there's a media frenzy and I waved my anonymity. I'm, I'm, a, I'm very public about my life and um, so I was willing to be the person that spoke out on behalf of many many women who for very good reason <laughs> Women who, for very good reason, cannot speak out, and I totally understand that. I totally get that, and I speak for you. I speak for them women, and I will do till the day I die, because there's loads of women out there silenced by this. Anyway, so I was on the Today programme, and we all know the lovely people who produce and... Um, present the radio he's, he's retired now oh bless him <laughs> should have given me the job um anyway um so i'm sat I, oh so first of all i arrive at the studio and i hear we sat outside the studio sat with my lawyer fantastic harriet wistrich round of applause <laughs> and you know they always introduce um, what's coming next and they the the, the um i always say strap line which is the I intro oh, the, the intro, intro. <laughs> the intro to it was would you let a former prostitute look after your children <laughs> and i mean this this is some you know we're in court fighting i mean it's just ridiculous they, they really need to be more intelligent people doing these jobs um so when I sat down, I was, uh, I was ready. I was ready before I even got in there. And I sat down and they said, can you, you can understand the people's concerns about... And I was just like, Do they not, can they not hear how ridiculous that sounds? So I said to them, well, perhaps the best person to ask that is my son. <laughs> you know, ask my child that anyway he did go on the next day and he told him straight and he shut <laughs> on up um, but I'm, and I'll just I'll, I'll just uh, quickly finish off so that there's if there's any questions um, and then I went on another TV program and told the director do not use the term sex worker I sat down live TV and what do they introduce me as? A former sex worker. Um, it's just absolutely ridiculous. But that's why I would encourage anyone to speak live because you can, I just shut them down then. And, and there's a, you know, tumbleweed moment because they can't really argue with my truth. Um, and the pro-sex lobby are always, always speaking for the women, but have never ever ever had to lay on the backs or um you know do the do do the job job anyway um yeah that's just a little of my experience thank you and um, we have time for one more question we have time for a couple of questions uh if ross got the microphone um wishful thinking uh, so. Sasha. Hi, can you tell us a bit about what Press for Change, which is a great name, what it has done, what you plan to do, and have you, what kind of impact have you noticed? 
Well, um, we've only just sort of set the course up and we've, we've already run two, two, um, I think two or three. Uh, it was sabotaged by somebody from the Pro Lobby <laughs> who arrived and tried to constantly talk us, talk us down when we were, um, you know, presenting um, and coming up with all this, all the usual scenario um, but to be fair the majority have been young journalists in training so that's been really a really positive thing and um, they came with the notion that sex work was a great great thing and we managed I think to change their views I think what's difficult is there's no way Julie and I are going to be biased about this situation and people when they're being trained want want a bias well you can't be biased you, you're either pro or you're abolition and so and, and we'll grow and we'll learn we're learning as well on that journey but um i suppose now it's about getting well-seasoned uh journalists you know all in all in that room, everybody in that room, and people who have got the the power, so the heads of the BBC, the you know. But um, you know, that, it's not it's not easy, but we'll see. Well, just to add to that, um, we are very clear about the position that we take and why about this, and what we say is what you hear from and who you hear from are organisations that have a vested interest in campaigning and lobbying for decriminalisation. Um, and here's how, and here's who they are. Here, for example, is the background to the International Union of Sex Workers that was an affiliated branch of the GMB, shame on them, um, where, in fact, they're not international, they're not a union, and none of them have been in sex work. So they're mainly punters and academics researching prostitution um, and, and the, the, you know, the odd kind of... Um, manager for so-called strippers um, so just giving them that information means that what we're saying to them is look, there's no such thing as a clean slate on this right when you write a news report you have a view and it comes out if you think that you've got a completely impartial view on this you haven't but what at least you can do is listen to a variety of voices on this rather than just going to the ECP or the IUSW that say that they represent everyone. Mm. So, you know, we're very clear about this. We say, you know, we, we have a very firm position, but so do you, and so do the other people that you're talking to. <coughs> Sorry, we have run out of time on that one. Um, Sorry to try and prematurely to close. Uh, but yeah, give a warm round of applause.